in our proceedings. Okay, all right. Let's try to make some good progress today. Um, because it's really technically our last day to talk about Aristotle. And what's my black C? Superstitious on this. Oh, it's back there. Forget it. I thought I might sit down since we have a small class today. <coughs> um, so, did you get a chance to look at the PDF on Aristotle and happiness? The ethics? Well, <coughs> it's a really good translation of Aristotle's ethics. Um, it's basically a really good text because um, he's delivering it to non-philosophers. Uh, and he's writing it for his son. Um, and so he asks the question, which he's already answered in the metaphysics, which we looked at, like what's the purpose of life? And what is the simple purpose of life that we find in his book, The Metaphysics? It's to contemplate things as they really are, to understand why things are the way that they are. That's the purpose of life. And he gives us a formula for how to understand things like that. He gives us several different ways to answer that question. And then he says, once you are in connection with the purpose of life, you've come into connection with what it means to come into connection with God. Yeah? So you contemplate things, and in that contemplation, you're in a relationship of love with the creator of all things, the unmoved mover. And we looked at the argument that he makes for the unmoved mover, which we don't necessarily have to review unless there's any questions. So the ethics, uh, he, he opens up by basically introducing a term in Greek, which is a, a very important term in Aristotle's world. And it is really what we get the term happiness from. Eudomania, eudomania, something like this. It's E-U, I'll spell it out for you. It's, uh, this is the Greek term if anyone's interested in it. It's, uh, You die. It's uh, Greek for happiness. Okay? So, Aristotle basically says the uh, purpose of being a human being is to attain happiness. Not, not too big of a surprise to us here in the United States. Why is that not a surprise to us? That's what we claim to be our mantra. Exactly, yeah. Emphasize claim. That's right, that's right. And when you have a society that's riddled with inequality and tension and difficulty, someone like Lady Bird doesn't quite fit in when she seeks happiness. There's conflict when she seeks happiness. You see, Aristotle believes the same thing. Which is why he says there's three types of people that seek three different types of happiness in the world. The first are the masses. The masses. Okay? What? How do the masses define happiness? In, according to Aristotle. Take a guess. Again, read, read this PDF because of all the PDFs and all of the readings we've had thus far, it's the most clear. It's the easiest one. There's no, there should be no problem reading it. How would the, how would the, the everyday person define what, what it means to be happy. Uh, no, not exactly that. 
No, it's not like mind control. Yes? That's exactly right. Nice, nice work. And they define it by pleasure. They define it by pleasure and enjoyment. So what's the second category? Second category are people who dedicate themselves to political life. Now, we don't mean like senators or congressmen only. It's much broader than that. It's much broader than that. By political life, you could also include a police officer could include someone who works at a nonprofit organization, someone who uh, teaches at a university, someone who contributes to the civic cohesion of the society. And Aristotle says for them, happiness is found in Practical activity. Okay? So this is a new introduction of a new way to become happy, which is different than what he says in the metaphysics. In the metaphysics, he's really only talking to the third group, which are the philosophers. Okay? And we already know what it means to be happy for the philosopher. What does it mean? You see, in philosophers, you could also include religious people. Priests, <coughs> theologians, people, men and women of God, etc. Right? How, how are those types of people happy? Faith, yes, well, I'm trying to broaden Aristotle's categories. You see, uh, only people like that didn't quite exist in the Greek society at that time. When they were saying to unite or the No, no. Remember, what unites, uh, <coughs> ideally, we'll, we'll define what it means to be happy, but the point of happiness is that these things. They equal the highest end, the highest end. So they are good in themselves. In that sense, they are ends. Yeah? It's the answer for the philosophers, anybody, yes? Uh, when they think that they can contribute to the enlightenment of people, no, that would be more here, because these people have a duty of service. Yeah. Think back to the metaphysics, the last three classes. What is the big thing I always said? What's the point of all this? Purpose of God. Contemplation. Contemplation. So in, in Aristotle's world, you know, he says something super, super nice and super interesting, I think, that we should meditate on for a minute. If only the philosophers can adequately get at the explanatory knowledge of things, the primary essence of things, they are the ones who have privileged access to this. Right? Okay? In terms of making an account of the truth of, of matter, of issues of justice, issues of beauty, issues of a, a, a political nature. The philosophers, just like Plato argued, have to play a very important role in 
this sphere as well in the political life. Because they're the ones that have a privileged access to the truth. They're not privileged, but they, they have the most rigorous means and method by which to get at the truth. So anyway, so the thing he says, which is super interesting for us, and something for you that I want you to think about, is that he says, you know, in ethics it's really important to have friends that share common understandings of happiness with you. And oftentimes we develop friendships because their definition of happiness and our definition of happiness is compatible, right? You see? You, you agree? In your own life? Okay? Okay. Well, he says the first thing that we should flag is that this needs to be put above friendship. So friendship is the glue of society. Friendship is the glue that keeps things together because it allows for happiness to flourish. But it cannot be abrogated. It cannot be relegated above truth. So we should be, we should be prepared at any point. What, what then is the consequence of that? I mean, have you ever had a friend or a situation come up in your life, maybe even a family member, where you've decided to side with the truth of the situation as opposed to the allegiance of the friendship bond? Have you? Maybe. Oh, you don't have to. I mean, obviously, that's too personal. I'm not gonna. I'm not that kind of guy. But if anybody wishes to share, that would be amazing. You see, it's very, very, very similar to Socrates' argument that he makes that I would prefer to die. I would prefer to die than escape. You see why it's similar? It's similar because uh, Plato and Aristotle believe that they've developed a theory of truth which is very different than the theory of truth that existed before them. What was the theory of truth that existed before them? It was a kind of Donald Trump theory of truth, which is, Truth is whatever I can convince you that it is. Yeah? Whatever I can come up with in the moment to sell, you agree it's truth, I agree it's truth, we have a deal. Truth as art of the deal, yeah? Of course, I, I, I'm agnostic about Trump, I mean, my God. He was elected because Americans are suffering, my God, of course, it's, it's nothing to do with that, I have no problem with that. But you see my point. You see my point. My point precisely is that truth, in their view, is like a revolutionary thing. It really is there. Like, it's not a matter of dispute as it pertains to its existence. It's, in fact, another name for the metaphysics is science. Yeah? I mean, Aristotle is also like the first natural scientist. So for him, at this time in thought, philosophy is linked to science. So it's important to know. Okay. We'll get rid of this. You see, because... Uh, There's conflict in society over happiness. There's conflict over happiness. And a lot of it resides, in Aristotle's view, with the reality that the masses conception of happiness is an inadequate and false conception of happiness. Because pleasure is a means, not an end. It's not an end. 
And we'll define what an end is. It's not a first principle. It's not the truth. So when I say maybe you broke friendships with someone over the truth, maybe you thought to yourself, actually, I've never done that. But now that I've just defined this being an in inadequate end, maybe you actually rethink and say, actually, no, I did break a friendship over somebody because they were very superficial in how they saw the world. Or they only cared about material things. Or they actually cared way too much about money. They were way too concerned about status for me, and it was a little over the top, right? It may be uncomfortable, right? You see, so uh, happiness is a source of profound conflict itself. So, unfortunately, who do you think these people are for, for Plato as it pertains to the cave allegory? Sleep. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. You know, there's a new argument of a translation of the cave allegory where everybody used to think that they were chained to watch chain, like physically locked. Some people argue that they were never chained. But they shouldn't be. Hmm? They didn't know where they were hmm. going. And ah, well, ah, ah, yes, yes, but why? That's a question of desire. It's a very, very nice question. <laughs> it's kind of a scary question if you think about it. They're deriving some pleasure from what they're seeing on the wall. And they want to stay there, continuing to consume it. In our society, we wouldn't call someone like that a slave, would we? It's a little strong, right? We'd call them slaves in our own temptation. You could, yeah, definitely. But are you prepared to do that? Metaphor. Are you prepared to break a friendship because somebody's like that? You see, that's what he means. You see my point? That's kind of intense. That's kind of intense. I mean, St. Paul would even take it a step further, right? Like, actually, you must renounce your brother, your sister, your cousin, like even your own mother, if you want to join this community. That's why I love Christianity because it's an anti-identitarian religion. Christianity, from its early inception, calls upon the individual to, uh, if you like, shatter their former identity and enter into something completely new. This is the meaning of the like baptism itself. This is also why, like in American society, you have a conception of what was called born again Christians. And the born-again Christians tend to be the ones who have the most uh, charismatic faith. Same, same sense that alcoholics. They're very much like alcoholics. Alcoholics who've gone through the AA program, they're like, who they were then to who they are now is like a 180. It's like they were someone else. Now they're someone else. <laughs> it's interesting, huh? <clears throat> So, so truth is more important than friendship. I think if you were honest, you could find some ways to critique Aristotle on that point. You may think to yourself, actually, that's a little bit intense. I mean, wouldn't, if, if this, let's say, is the currency of what it means to be happy in American society today, pleasure, enjoyment, right? You wouldn't have any friends if you were a philosopher. Your only friends would be other philosophers. Take it from somebody who knows. <laughs> you see what I mean, though? No? No? You see, so philosophy is like a weapon, man. It's not, it's not some, like, a... Um, 
manby pamby thing. It's like um, there's consequences to following this doctrine. You know? Look at this. They said Happy Friday. My God. Okay, so maybe I'm a little bit too intense here. But it is true that there's a conflict. So that's thesis that I want to say, number one. Number two, let's talk a little bit about why pleasure is inadequate. So we know that, bless you, we know that in the ethics, and by the way, by the way, just make a note of this for your papers. If you read Crisp's translation that I put up there, called the excerpts there, yeah? it's a wonderful text to cite for your papers. Why? Well, he clearly delineates how his conception of the good is different than Plato's conception of the good. In essence, that whole debate we had about the forms, how like, we already know the critique that he has of Plato's forms, right? They're too abstract, they're outside of the natural world, like, your whole, your whole theory of knowledge is, is crazy, dude. Like, you're basically saying, like, knowledge is remembered from some place. So basically, what you're saying is that in order for me to be a good guitar player, let's say, for example, or to be a good uh, graphic designer, um, are you saying that I should just meditate on the abstract form idea of that? That doesn't seem right. That seems inadequate. Like, that's, that's like too much of this. I mean, contemplation doesn't help us answer the question of getting things done in the world. What about uh, activity? Like, how is something good in 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 its uh, actual motion? And it's it, again, Aristotle's always interested in connecting it to the motion <coughs> and the reality of the thing itself, not the abstract idea of it. Okay, so that's all to say. Look at the section there, and I think it'll be very. If, if you've struggled with the difference between Plato and Aristotle, if you've struggled with that difference on the forms, and I know that you have, or you think one is dumb and the other one is dumb and all of that, but if you felt that way, look at the ethics and you'll see it's actually very clear. Does somebody have their hand up? Yes, sir. I was going to say if you agree with this, that there are only three types of ethics. Do I personally? Hmm? Um, well, you know, <laughs> how much time do you have? <laughs> In my training, I uh, am deeply influenced by psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis puts forward a definition of the human being, which is very different than the Aristotelian conception because it's predicated on this thing called the unconscious. So the psychoanalytic understanding of the human being means that mm, happiness is something that <coughs> is never quite attainable in its full sense. So I'm a bit more of a pessimist when it comes to happiness. A bit more of a pessimist. Of course, uh, what I can say about happiness is that I am adamantly opposed to its instrumentalization on the one hand. By that I mean like it's a market, <coughs> it's a connection to a market logic. I'm opposed to that formula. I think it actually leads to a lot of its opposite. And what do I mean by like market formulation? Like a good example is like Fight Club. Who's seen the movie Fight Club? Fight Club. Fair, enough people, okay, so I'll share this reference. What does Tyler Durden or 
who's the double of the other main character, say, when he calls his father, and he's in about his mid-twenties, and he says, Dad, I've done everything you've told me to. I went to college. I got married. I got a job. But I've reached a precipice of the end of all of those things that you told me to do in order that I would reach this place of quote-unquote happiness, right? So what next? And in some ways, the film is about the fact that actually there is nothing there. All of that's just like an instrumental formula, which is not even the answer to what happiness is itself. So I am opposed to happiness as that kind of template. I'm opposed to template happiness. No. You still want me to go on this? You still want me to go on this? Okay, so uh, number one, but it's even more complex than that. Because in our society, the marketization of happiness can become more profound in negative ways. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you are thrown outside of the template, if your existence in this society is not, doesn't fit the template, you have a situation on your hands whereby you are forced to scrap and fight to attain something which is beyond the template. So, a lot of people are unhappy in this society because they've been kicked out of the template. It didn't fit somehow. Yeah? But then, oftentimes, those people realize that the source, in a weird way, of what might make them happy is not even to go back in to this pre-formatted thing, right? It's like they, they learned that actually happiness is found through the circumvention of that. And here you're introduced to something like what I would call is like a denial of one's own destiny. So if you live in a capitalist society where happiness is understood as a pre-formatted thing that you just sort of enter into and you go. You swallow this pill, you take this pill, you take that pill, and you're good. The big question that philosophy would ask is like, uh, what happens if you reject the pill? Yeah? Or what happens if you take the other pill? So, I'm more interested in happiness like that, to be honest with you. Because at some point, I become convinced that this is some type of vehicle for me personally. Because it gives me, it gives me something. It gives me like a stable backdrop by which I can revisit and assess my life. So I don't know if that whole metaphor of the template makes some sense to you, but that's how I would answer your question. But I mean, it's a worthwhile question, right? I mean, it's a worthwhile question because we're not robots. We're not artificial intelligence. We are human beings. And Aristotle says in the metaphysics that by virtue of being a human being, we want to know the truth of things. But he never says that all of us necessarily will become happy. It's not our destiny to become happy. In fact, he's giving this lecture, one we're reading, and he says something which may be bad news for you, which is that younger people, they're not ready to be happy. Sorry. Yeah. They're not ready to be happy. Why do you, why do you think he says they're not ready to be happy? Yeah, they haven't experienced enough. That's, that's pretty much the main reason. But the other, other big reason is that they have not had enough practical activity. They haven't exercised this capacity that we have, that we train ourselves in becoming more happy, which is what he calls character, right? Do you believe that that definition of happiness is valid? Do I believe that's valid? No, Aristotle. Uh, he believes, yeah, good question, good question. Check, check. 
X? No. Yes. Practical activity is a valid path for achieving happiness. Yes. Absolutely. It is a life of action. And uh, what he wants to say is that you have a kind of definition of happiness, which is what he calls the achievement of the good in relationship to virtuous <coughs> action. So here you have, on the one hand, the good, okay? You have like the individual, right? And then you have virtuous action. And this here is the middle between the two for which your virtuous action must aim. Think of the metaphor of an archer. An archer does not always hit the mark, the bullseye, right? Right? But he tries to shoot, or she tries to shoot, a lot of arrows this way, right? Towards the bullseye. The reason that young people are not fully happy, they can, they can be close, is because they don't hit the bullseye that much. Because to be happy is a work of constant action. To be happy is to reach excellence in your actions. Yeah? So if I am a philosopher, to be happy would be to reach some excellence in my contemplation. And I, we can define that maybe by the invention of a new concept. Yeah? Like I'm actually most happy if I am collaborating with my friends about some obscure ideas and I develop some new way to think about a problem in philosophy. This would be a good definition of me hitting the mark of the arrow. So the good, ah, you see the syllogism? Because on the one hand, this stuff over here is particular. This is universal. And the action is the third part. So like, you know that three part achievement of the essence of the thing. There are many goods because there are many virtuous actions and we can list them. Like in my own life, like I'm a father, I'm a philosopher, I do some work in film, like I have many other things that I try to reach excellence in, right? Well, each of those things, each of those things produce a particular good. But it's not only particular, because it's also connected to, like, when I'm excellent in them, a universal part of the good. Which is, like, the form of the good, right? So, like, achieving excellence in one of those things is also achieving that abstract part of the good that Plato <coughs> talked about in the cave allegory, right? So these are, like, particular things you do. Let's say golfing. Let's say uh, freestyle lyrics. Like in my neighborhood on Friday nights, uh, we would get together and my friends would freestyle hip hop. It's actually really fun. I'm not somebody who freestyles, but I gained pleasure out of watching them reach excellence in their freestyle abilities. Right? That's not, okay, well, is that yeah. it's like a harmless kind of pleasure, right? It's not like, it's harmless, but it's not negative pleasure because I'm not treating that pleasure as a good. You see, you, 
for Aristotle, you cannot treat wealth, pleasure, money as a universal. It, it, it just doesn't work. Now, I'd actually like to pause right here and ask you all what you think about that proposal. Like, you're telling me that like <coughs> money cannot be this it, in and of itself? Or you may say, oh, you're trying to tell me that money can't help me make, do, make me do these things better? Well, the sad reality is, is it probably it can. No? I mean, if you had enough money to inject the steroids, uh, you'd be a better pitcher. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ah, it's true though, it's true, right? <laughs> of course, that's, that's a bad example though. That's not even fair, man. There's always an easier way, we just don't take it. Yeah, no, well, no, he's not making that complex of an argument that like, money would force you to cheat. He's not saying that, no, no, no. He's saying that uh, it's a, a form, it's, it's, it's a form which is, um, Not, not able to connect, you see, it's only a means to enter into this dynamic relationship of practice towards excellence. It would be interesting to ask the question, like, what would Aristotle think about a society which has profound wealth inequality, where some people actually can go to the Olympics because they have, their parents had a lot of money that allowed them to practice a lot, right? Like this is the whole thesis of the Tanya Harding movie. Incidentally, you know Tanya Harding grew up in my neighborhood in uh, Port Oregon? Mm hmm Yeah, yeah. I didn't know her, but like, I moved around a lot, but when I was like seven, we lived like a few blocks away from Tanya Harding. It's kind of a trip. Anybody seen the Tanya Harding movie? No? It's really good. Is it good? So, anyways, um, okay, I made my point about money. I think you all see my point, unless anybody wishes to sort of push back. Maybe somebody's like a business major or like a, kind of like, you know, wishes to make some argument that wealth can be conceived of as a good in and of itself. Because you know, we're going to talk later in this class about the question of social recognition. Like, what does it mean to derive some truth about yourself through the recognition of others? And what we're going to find out is that philosophers actually don't limit it to that one dimensional of a scenario. No. You know, there has to be some what philosophers call normative structure for recognition to take place. It has to be like a shared background of values and things that people agree upon before they engage in recognition. There's another point we're going to look at. Okay, so why, why golden mean? Why mean? Well, I told you before that uh, Aristotle breaks down the virtues and he links them to the emotions of the human being. And so, like, we are both, like, rational and emotional beings, right? And so there must be, like, I, I guess you could say this is sort of the origin of the necessary balance that we have to have, right? And there's no surprise, everybody knows this, like, get a hold of your emotions, right? Like, this is what, like, the self-help uh, thing is about you. You do the self help sometimes. Yeah. yeah. 
what, I mean, what is self-help really? If you were to explain, like, what is, like... You mean the book? Well, yeah, no, but, like, what is self-help <laughs> as a discourse? Like, why do we have self-help in our, in our world? Why does that exist? To get out of the dark place. To get out, okay, yeah, yeah that's, that's plausible. To achieve the goal. Ah, nice, yeah. To achieve, maybe this? To, to, put, to put things in maybe a clearer what, way, like give you like steps. Ah, I kind of want to make yeah. a list of these. These are good points. Dark place exit. Uh, I get out of the cave. Huh. To create more clarity with your situation a, at hand. A plan maybe. Yeah, plan ahead. Okay. Go again. What was it? Okay. Okay. Fix a problem. Yeah. Okay. Because I want to make this list and then I want to compare it to what Aristotle would say. If Aristotle came down in a time vessel, from like um, Dr. Emmett Brown McFly and McFly, what would he say about our world and what would he say about self-help? Because his book, The Ethics, is basically a book of self-help, you see. Okay. Maybe we'll see some commonalities in this list. What else? Maybe helps you identify your goals. Uh, yeah, no, 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 this is too much like plan ahead, no, it's pretty much, uh, yeah, kind of close, kind too of, close, yeah. yeah, kind of close. Well, how about something about emotions? Doesn't it help you with emotions? A lot, no? Isn't this like most, most of what it's about? Hmm? Dorothy, isn't it? I mean, you know, like what, like <coughs> people in our society uh, deal with a lot of anxiety? They deal with anger, they deal with lots of things like that, right? So let's put that down. Emotional, maybe stability, I guess. Ah, if we were very honest, wouldn't we also say like, success? We just hit something very negative for Aristotle. I'm almost feeling like success is being treated as an end, not a means. Or, or, or rather, or rather, or rather, if we put success, what's the definition of the success of the self-help mantra or discourse? It's not necessarily engaging in a practical activity to reach a point of excellence, uh, which is which is which is predicated upon a commitment to the society. That's number two. It's not number three, which is to investigate the cause of things at their final point. It's not. It's not that. So in that sense, it's. Practical, and it's limited to particular goals. So, what's it missing? What's it missing? My contention is that self-help is missing a philosophical universal. It's missing the forms. It's missing like some truth that is higher than what it is you wish to achieve with it. In other words, it's just another template. It doesn't have a connection here. Like, 
you're shooting an arrow, but does the self-help discourse say anything about what the outcome of the success of hitting that mark would be, other than just achieving some practical thing? Probably not. That's a problem then, right? When Aristotle says that for philosophers, is truth the end or the means? Like, is truth happiness or is truth a vehicle for it? Yeah, good, good, good point. Um, very nice point because uh, this and this are actions. They like. Contemplation is not a, he, he makes a distinction between an activity versus a condition. For your papers, remember this. Happiness, for Plato, is a condition. It's like, it just is. Happiness, for Aristotle, is an activity. It's an activity in motion. It's happening over and over. It's getting better, right? It's not like, like Kanye West is not a good freestyler in my opinion. However, maybe he's not a good freestyler because he doesn't practice enough. Right? Maybe he's too much of a platonist when he looks at freestyle. Maybe he just thinks like, oh man, I just, I know what freestyle is. I don't need, I don't need to practice. Yeah, that's actually a nice motif in films on sports and competition, which is often you have the underdog who wins by virtue of their practice versus the one who says, no, 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 this skill is given, baby. Like, this is, this is me. Like, this is, this is already universal, right? I don't need to practice, right? And then what happens? Rocky wins, right? Did you like the latest Rocky, the new one? The new one? You liked it? Just okay, he says. Why just okay? Did you like it? You didn't like it? Which one are you talking about? The new one. Creed? Creed, yeah. Yes, Creed. Yes. I like Creed. Oh, Creed is totally different from Rocky. Yeah. That's not oh, but it's the new Rocky. I don't know what you're saying. Okay Creed. okay, Creed, Creed. Yeah, it's, it's, you know what I mean by the new Rocky. You know what I mean. Like, for the new generation, yeah, it's like a continuation of that. Michael B. Jordan looks like he... <laughs> okay, sorry. The title of the film is Creed. Yeah, it's Creed, but it's, it's like... Oh, yeah, because Rocky is a character in it. Obviously, but it's draining <laughs> that guy, which is the son of the guy who... Hold it down. That Rocky defeated. I forgot his name. Apollo Creed. It's the son of Apollo Creed, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so like, it's not Rocky. Like, him the new Rocky. Rocky, you totally know it. It's a figure of speech, y'all. Come on. <laughs> you want to jump down my throat on that? Are you kidding me? I will annihilate you. Are you serious? You totally know what I mean by the new Rocky. You want to play games with me on a Friday night? All right, all right. You want to take the gloves off? Come on, it's the same type of movie. Thank you. Good, wow, wow. But what happens? What happens in the movie? Does he practice a lot, or does he just think it's God-given? Because there's actually a conflict over that, because his father was God-given, in some sense. So you, but, but actually, so then how does he get the motivation up? Because he had a negative relationship with his father, so that gives him an impetus to work. Is that right? What's the impetus of Creed's uh, work ethic? Where does it come from? Where does it come from? Why does he work hard in the movie? Uh, he had some conflict. What's a conflict? Rocky dying or something like that? He's just getting old. He's getting old, but that doesn't answer why he works hard. Like, why does he want? Why is he hungry for it? Oh, he wants to prove like he's not. Proves he's not his father. Yeah. It's a father thing, always. Yeah. Always yeah. a father thing. Daddy problems. Daddy problems. That's okay. <laughs> Gotta accept those daddy problems. <laughs> Right? So does this make sense to you now? Christina, does this make sense to you? Dumb? Dumb? Is it dumber than this, self-help? 
You don't know how to answer that, do you? Just give me uh, something. Because you said his theory of God is dumb, so I want to like fully flesh out whether his ethics are dumb. No, no. no, it's good. It's good. It's good. I mean, I'm giving you a hard time. I just, I love you. That's so funny. <laughs> uh, okay. I apologize. This is not the prettiest. I'm not the prettiest. <laughs> but you get the concepts, right? Huh? So the point is. Balance, not extremes, not extremes. Incidentally, there is another discourse of ethics in the Western tradition which emphasizes extremes. Is anybody familiar with the um, Oedipus drama? Familiar with Oedipus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just wrote a paper about comparing Aristotle's version yeah, versus the Sophoclean. Sophocles is the writer of Oedipus. Uh, and I make the point that you see uh, this idea that he has, Aristotle has here, particularly practical activity and like virtuous action. What's the point of all of that? Well, one of the big points is to promote a stability of social relations, right? Like, it's meant to create some harmony in the society. Keep everything together. Keep all the different spheres working together. But my question is, whoa, <laughs> that's a good model, that's a good theory for a society that's all put together, but what about a society that's all messed up? Like Lady Bird, <laughs> what do you do in a society like that? Does this thing even work? What if, what if in order to be good you have to go to extremes? Like Lady Bird. Lady Bird was not, no, she had, to, she had to do some dance. She had to go around, right? Is she a good person? At the end, actually, she achieved something good. But the means by which she got that good is not necessarily good, quote unquote good, right? You see, so the fault of the Aristotelian version of this is my contention that it depends upon an already stable society. What do you do, with this? What do, you do in, a, in this situation of a society that's already a little bit effed up? Like ours. Like, what do you do then, right? That's a good question, I think. So, I did promise we were going to watch a movie, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it time? Yeah, it's time, right? You guys done with this whole? But we got a lot. Out, we got a lot out of this, right? Everybody took notes. Feel good about it, right? In the back. Yeah. You feel better? Yeah. You feel better? Yeah, I'm much better. Good. All right. Any questions about this? Yes, sir. Let's see if I can articulate this. So, like, in psychology, we we studied happiness mm -hmm. and. I'm just curious on how we can define, I guess, whether a society is fucked up, sorry. Yep, yep. Um, and how that plays a role in some happiness. For example, we can probably, because we live in America, say, mm. okay, our society's effed up. It, it well, well we, 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 we can talk more about my contention that our society is effed up. Because you may disagree with me on that point. And that's good. We, should, well, yeah, I, we can talk about that in later classes, and I would love to. If you all agree, we should. Go ahead. Wait, but I, Let's just pretend for a minute we did it. Okay, yeah. Whether I disagree or uh, don't disagree, sure, but sure. say, for example, uh, take a country like India, yes. where the uh, 
I guess, economic yes. disparity is quite um, a huge more gap. More pronounced, yeah. <laughs> yes. How someone who is below that level may find more happiness than someone who is at the average. Right. Tier. Right. So I'm just curious on how his idea of happiness um, may play a role across different cultures, if we can apply it to that. Well, the problem that I have is more nuanced. His idea of the definition of the good, remember, is different than Plato's. In what sense? Plato's definition of the good is like something which we have to like approximate to. It's not found within the action. It's not found within the world exactly. For Aristotle, the good is found within the world. It is. So if you have a society in which there's disharmony, there's inequality, and there's conflict and friction. I mean, Aristotle addresses this to some point in his book, The Politics. But in my opinion, he doesn't adequately address the shifting nature of the good. Where does the good go if it cannot necessarily be realized through this careful balance? Yeah? Or what if this class of people here actually have a very different conception of the good, which is not actually producing the good for this other group of people? Yeah? He doesn't, give us the, he doesn't give us the answer to on how to deal with that. Other philosophers have solutions here. Yeah, but we're just starting out. We're getting our feet wet in philosophy. But pretty soon we'll meet some philosophers who will answer that question. Cool. Yeah. Uh, how does everybody feel on their papers? Okay. No questions? How do you feel? Uh, okay. <laughs> you good? Okay. Uh, A plus. Okay, okay. See, ever since you said Aristotle's dumb, I'm going to give you a hard time. It's just it's my job. You gotta be careful. Okay. What movie shall we watch? What clip shall we watch? Huh? What? Oh, somebody blurted something out. Any black mirror? Yeah, <laughs> nah, come on.